Let me just tell you a little about John Duca. It's a real privilege to have him come and join us. And, and this is a result of work that he is doing with John Milbau. They've been working together for quite a long time now. John is Vice President and Associate Director of Research at the Federal Reserve Bank at Dallas and does research in macroeconomics. He'd been in Dallas since 91, right? right? And you were, you were out east before that. Right. At the Fed in Washington. But New York or Washington? Washington. Washington for some years. And he's written very widely on money, credit, wages, all manner of macroeconomic things, and housing, particularly the kind of work that he's doing with John at the minute. He was a staff economist earlier at the Fed in, in Washington, where he worked with both Greenspan and way back with Paul Volcker. And he's also taught at the University of Maryland and is now teaching at the Southern Methodist University. So a very wide career spanning both academic life and working in policy institutions. I thought he gave us a huge range of, uh, John sent me a, a, a long and complicated email that said, here's a heap of things that John Duca <laughs> could talk to us all about. And it seemed to me particularly interesting that he talked to us about this macroprudential paper. And um, thank you very much. Well, we're all looking forward to it very well, much. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here. This paper is co-authored with Lilith Papillon and Susan Wachter. And what we try to do is make sense of what is going on with all the efforts after the great crisis to reform the financial system to make it safer and more uh, resilient. And so in a certain sense, it's really meant as an overview of something quite complicated. For example, if you look at the book, uh, the, the book on Dodd-Frank, uh, Dodd-Frank regulations are about 1,500 pages long. Um, it serves as a wonderful uh, book, bookshelf uh, <laughs> Uh, item in my, in, in, in my, my office in the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. And of course, everything I say is going to be my own opinion, not necessarily that of the Fed. I do need to say that so that on Wednesday when I fly back to the States, they don't, uh, they don't reroute my plane to Guantanamo. Uh, now, I'm going to first, uh, in terms of organizing the presentation, talk a little bit about the shifts in the views on the, whether or not we needed uh, macroprudential risks and policies. Uh, before the Great Recession in the United States, regulation had focused on what we call microprudential uh, risk. The idea was that uh, the regulators would focus on the insolvency and the viability of an individual institution, not taking into account its spillover effects and the rest of the system, because it was thought that the Basel capital requirements and the supervisory system that was in place was enough to uh, pre protect against macroprudential risks and that moreover if the central banks kept inflation near, uh, near its low target that the financial system would be resilient enough to withstand the shocks and that if there was a financial uh, uh, shock of some sort that macro policy would have it both enough time and be able to clean it up. And there was also an underappreciation under of what risks real estate posed to the financial system. And this view was shattered um, by the... Um, We're in trouble. Was shattered by the uh, experience of the Great Recession. You haven't lost, lost any pictures yet? I may have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, let me see if I can add lib. Um, so, uh, yes, we did lose a few pictures. And so what they show, <laughs> you'll just have to uh, deal with the, uh, the hand signals. Um, we, we had a big rise in house prices and a collapse. But we also had a huge rise and fall in commercial real estate prices. And it was just as big. And if anything, the combination of the two was what really hurt a lot of financial institutions in the United States. And there was something common to both of them. Now, one of the big things with the financial crisis was the role of real estate. And in some work Michael Bordeaux has done with Joe Halbrick, uh, they have said that, you know, the, the, the emphasis that 
uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff put on overall debt is, is a little misplaced. The real, the real problem seems to be when we have these real estate booms and busts because it's very difficult and costly to clean it up. Now the markets uh, had been funding a lot of real estate investment in the United States and they had under, underestimated the downside tail risk of prices. There was this view in the United States that house prices never fell except in the Great Depression and in fact that was not quite right because in the late 1980s we had a mini housing price bubble in the Northeast and in California and we, we had some regional house price declines. And what happened in the United States was we went to a system where a lot of the provision of lending was securitized. And so the funding depended on market decisions, financial market decisions, rather than the decisions of financial intermediaries per se. And the markets severely underestimated these, these real estate risks. And what this manifested itself in was that there were all these credit enhancements made to the packaging of mortgage-backed securities. And one of the key, there were, there were two key ways that they did this. One was to take the mortgage, the mortgages in a mortgage-backed security, and we're dealing with the risky stuff, not the prime. So we're dealing with commercial mortgage-backed securities, and what we call private label mortgage-backed securities. These were the private label mortgage-backed securities funded the vast, vast majority of what you call subprime and close to subprime loans. And one of the ways that they did this was they took, they, they basically say the first losses would be borne by holders of a certain class of securities, and, and this is what was referred to as a credit default obligation, so the lower tranches would bear, the, would bear most of the losses if they occurred. The upper tranches would be protected. This structure gave people the, the, the illusion that they were protected, when in fact, if a tail risk occurred, the losses would penetrate into the investment grade uh, ranks. The other thing was the, um, the, the pricing of many mortgage-backed securities would be actually priced off corporate bond bonds. Well, corporate bonds are different category of, of, of debt. And to some extent, it's a, there was a mispricing there. The other thing that was going on were big changes in regulation. If you think about it, why did the United States not have a major real estate collapse like we experienced in the Great Recession since the Great Depression? Well, there were all these regulations from the Great Depression years. And these regulations limited the ability of banks and savings and loan associations to take on excessive risks. But the regulatory structure um, was, was rel relatively well. In the 2000s, we changed that structure. The first change occurred in 2000, and this was very important. Uh, there, there, in the old days, if a... Uh, let me this way. Many of the mortgage-backed securities that were not based on prime loans were sold with credit protections. These credit protections were based on derivatives. In particular, credit default swaps. And these derivatives were not feasible before 2000. Uh, and I'll give you an example. In the old days, if you were a farmer, and you had a credit derivative, you had a derivative product that protected you against a change in, uh, let's say, the price of corn, you're raising corn. And suppose you're dealing with the Archer Daniels Midland Corporation, a big, big buyer of farm crops. If you engage in a derivative contract with ADM, chances are the state where you operated would recognize that as a valid contract. But however, if you engage in a contract with somebody, let's say, who is not involved in agriculture, there's a chance that in case of a default that the judge would not recognize that or give it much priority in bankruptcy. The Commodity Futures Modernization Act was passed in late 2000. It changed everything. It basically said that if a company had a derivatives obligation, so suppose I insured your holding of a junk bond, 
that that derivative contract would be honored before the regular debt holders in case of bankruptcy. And so all of a sudden, these derivative contracts have uh, this extra liquidity. They are they're enforceable. And the credit default market just takes off. It's unfortunate that the slides isn't here. The credit default market literally takes off like a rocket. And all of a sudden, it becomes feasible. These are credit default swaps. They go from zero to 60 trillion. 60 trillion. This is gross. They surge. And they fall after all sorts of problems emerge in the subprime market. Yeah. Now these, these uh, products enabled the issuance of more private mortgage-backed securities. Before this, there were very subprime mortgages were, were not very widespread. If you were a bank, the regulators didn't look kindly upon you if you were making subprime loans which you couldn't securitize and you were holding them in the portfolio. With these credit derivatives and the magic of a credit default obligation, you could sell us in the financial markets. The risk was underpriced. Investors thought that they were getting something investment grade, and in fact, they were getting junk. And so issuance of both, <laughs> you'll have to bear with me, uh, the um, blue line is private mortgage-backed securities, the Commodity Futures Modernization Act is passed here, they start taking off, and so do, and you see a little upward drift in commercial mortgage-backed securities, which funded a lot of commercial mortgages. The next step was in mid-2004, they cut the capital requirements on banks if they held mortgage-backed securities that were investment grade. So what were they? Before um, 2004, if you were a bank and you made a mortgage loan that was not a, um, it was either a commercial mortgage or a non-prime mortgage, you had to fund it with 8% capital at a minimum. If you held that, those mortgages in the form of a private mortgage-backed security or a commercial mortgage-backed security, you also had held 8% capital. And that 8% capital would absorb the first losses. So in other words, if you bought a mortgage-backed security and you lost 5%, the shareholders would eat the first 5% loss on that uh, before, let's say, the deposit even gets to the deposit insurance fund. Well, in the infinite wisdom of regulators, they cut that, they cut that risk weight such that that capital requirement fell from 8% to 1.6%. The shields are down. There's virtually no, you don't have to hold much capital at all against this stuff. And what happens? That's the extra juice that takes the subprime, issuance of subprime securities into the stratosphere. And along with it, commercial mortgage-backed securities also soar. And they're up there, and, and, and the market is just being flooded. So picture this. You have a, a wall of finance, a wall of demand, people with mortgages buying properties. And the properties are not turning over much. I'll give you an example. In American residential housing markets, take an established neighborhood, there's about 5% annual turnover, meaning 5% of the homes sell in a given year, reflecting. 5% of the families are selling a house, either they're moving out of the neighborhood, relocating, or maybe somebody passed away. That 5% supply is matched by 5% demand, from people relocating in or young people converting from renters to owners. And that balance, about 5% of the housing stock selling, that balance is a really a flow demand flow, is an equilibrium between flows, not stocks, in the short run. All of a sudden, you get a wall of finance, and more people qualify. Instead of 5% of the population chasing 5% of the houses, you have 7%. And then you have the supply-demand imbalance, and the prices shoot up. So, oh, well, good, we did have, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
CFMA gets passed, private mortgage backed securities go up, the big banks have lobbied for changes in, in, these, uh, in these capital requirements. They come in the midsummer, but everybody knew that they were there beforehand. Um, <laughs> and things soar. The other thing that also happened was that the investment banks, Lehman, Bayer, Morgan Stanley, Goldman, uh, the biggies, and Merrill, they also had their effective capital requirements cut as well. And their leverage soared. So you had the big commercial banks and the investment banks. They're involved in this business. You see the soaring of, of credit default swaps. You see the soaring of uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities. And then we have, in the summer of 2007, was when the financial crisis really began, when several hedge funds had to basically stop redemptions of subprime mortgage, uh, uh, from subprime mortgage uh, exposed portfolios. Uh, when you invest in an investment fund, a hedge fund, you have to price the security. There were no prices in the crisis. They all dried up in the summer of, of 2007. And so some of the hedge funds said, we're suspending redemptions. We can't sell out your shares in our hedge fund because we can't price the securities. And then everything started coming unglued, and you end up having the beginnings of a crisis. So, how did this manifest itself? In the housing markets, uh, individuals have the tax deduction in the United States. And so what happened was, if the risks are underpriced, it took not so much the form of low mortgage rates, but rather uh, the non-priced terms of credit were eased. No? Chuck didn't come up. Okay, so. <laughs> That's very annoying, isn't it? I'm going to go one further and see if it's lurking. Okay. Like, uh, it's not lurking anywhere. Oh, oh well. Oh dear. Okay, well. <laughs> this is a chart <laughs> of the effective capital requirement on mortgages. It looks, uh, it looks like this. And it's inverted scale. So in the early 1990s, they increased the capital requirement from about 5.5% on loans to 8%. This is an inverted scale. And what that does is it makes giving high loan-to-value, high-risk loans, it makes it more costly for an institution to hold these things because they have more skin in the game. They get eased a little bit when Fannie and Freddie um, start buying some subprime mortgages, and investors, uh, like banks, can hold Freddie and Fannie debt with a 4% capital requirement. That gets cut to a 1.6. This is an inverted scale. It's up there. And what happens? <laughs> Loan-to-value ratios move with them, essentially. So in other words, uh, <laughs> you'll have to pretend, pretend it's there. Uh, what happens in the housing markets is that the, credits, the credit standards, the percent of deposit or down payment, goes down. And for first-time home buyers, it falls from about, it, it falls from about 12% to about basically zero. No money down. The median first-time buyer who is getting a mortgage in the United States in 2006 had nothing down. Good. Very, very <coughs> risky. <clears throat> um, so you get this easing of credit standards. You get this wall of finance, all these extra people wanting to buy a home. And remember, there's only a limited supply of houses on the market. House prices start to rise. People start to anticipate that prices are going to continue to rise. That encourages people to expect high appreciation and, and such that basically house is a great investment. You, so you get this amplification because it's a thinly traded asset. That amplifies things and you get a real big boom. So the real mortgage rate is the after-tax mortgage rate subtract off expected price appreciation. So an easing of standards. House prices start, appreciation starts to rise. 
People start to view the real carrying cost of, of a house as going down. That amplifies things more, and you get a big uh, rise in house prices. In the commercial real estate markets, on the other hand, um, it's a little bit different. And there what happened was investors in commercial real estate said, well, we have a required rate of return on investing in a, in a property. And that, that required rate of return is like an earnings price ratio. What are, what are rents relative to prices? And that, that should be a function of the treasury rate, let's say the long-term treasury rate, which is a safe rate, plus a risk premium over that. That risk premium reflects what stake, what skin in the game does a financial institution bear? Over half of the commercial real estate mortgages are made by, are held directly by banks, and another 15% or so are in the form of commercial mortgage-backed securities. At the margin, commercial mortgage-backed securities are the way that institutions like to hold more commercial mortgages. Think about it. Do you want to own one building in one particular city that may get hit by a hurricane, for example, or would you rather have a share in a diversified portfolio of commercial properties in the form of a commercial mortgage-backed security. So it becomes the marginal way that banks hold commercial real estate. You lower the capital requirements, how much skin in the game you have, and you will demand a lower risk premium. And this is, in fact, what seems to be have gone on. Um, so the um, capital requirement, so the, so the risk premia are a function, you're going to have to pretend again. Uh, the risk premia are a function of the capital requirements on commercial mortgages. Now, commercial mortgages were never really, uh, they had basically an 8% capital requirement up to 2004. That gets cut down to one6 the other thing that's also going on is when investors are thinking about what risk premium am I going to demand, they say, well, it's got to be a combination of how much skin in the game I have, what's my risk exposure, that's the capital requirement, and what is the general riskiness of the atmosphere. And they, you, there you can think about a corporate bond spread, let's say a BAA rate over, a, a, over let's say, a 10-year treasury. Well, those things all conspire. They all come down in the mid-2000s. Risk premium fall. Earnings price ratios fall. That means, and the way that that happens is rents don't go up. Rents don't go down much. They tend to be fairly stable. The prices, for the earnings price ratio to fall, the prices have to soar. Remember, the earnings price ratio is the reverse of a P.E. ratio. P.E. ratio soared on commercial real estate. That was the main driver. Um, now, um, the other thing that happened, so you have this, the commercial real estate market and the residential real estate market both get overvalued, overvalued, essentially. Now, the other thing that was a problem with the pre-recession consensus was an underappreciation of correlated risks. There was this view that in America that there is direct finance and indirect finance. Direct finance is finance that comes from the financial markets, the issuance of bonds, commercial paper, stocks by well-established firms, and indirect finance, which many small firms and most individuals get through financial intermediaries, like banks or finance companies. And as long as one of them is operating, there's a spare tire in the system. The problem was the crisis hit both tires. It was a correlated risk. The finan and both of these things collapsed at the same time. We hadn't had this happen since the Great Depression. The eventual house price risk, uh, sorry, house price bust that occurred, so we had this overvaluation, and then the crash comes, really threatened the, the, the function of the financial system, and these correlated risks created a severe recession. 
The other thing that happens is, and this is a problem with any kind of debt funded boom, is that the prices of the assets may come down, the bubble in the assets may be gone, but the debt persists. The debt is an overhang now. And that makes it really difficult for a macro economy to recover when there's a real estate recession. To illustrate that, let's think about, and this is a chart that John and I have used, and I actually used this internally um, about a half a year before Lehman Brothers died, mm -hmm. to illustrate the risks that could emerge from a mortgage, housing, and what we call a leverage crisis. So before you have the boom, then you have the reversal of the, credits, of the credit standards from super easy to everybody realizing there's too much risk in the system. What does that do? Well, the first thing it does is if it's harder to get a mortgage, there's a lower demand for housing because people, fewer people qualify for a mortgage. That hurts housing construction. And housing construction had risen to about 4.5% of US GDP. But then it collapsed and fell to like 2.5%, and that lowers gross domestic product. A lower demand for housing also lowers house prices. And by the 2000s, uh, the Americans uh, discovered what the British had discovered before, what they, they, borrow, they were borrowing against the house price appreciation to fund consumer spending, quite a bit of consumer spending. Well, it works both ways. If the prices come down, there's less housing wealth to use as collateral to borrow against, and consumption gets in. Moreover, the ability to borrow against every dollar of accumulated uh, net housing worth also fell. That hurt consumption, which is the biggest component of US GDP. Now, had none of this on the other side happened, we would have had a standard US recession. <coughs> but there's a problem when you have a bust like this. The collateral values fall, foreclosures rise, and there are big losses to the capital positions of both banks and, and, and non-bank financial firms. So if you're a bank and you have to meet an 8% capital requirement, and all of a sudden you take three, four percentage point losses in, on your entire portfolio, now you are short of capital. You're in violation of the regulatory capital requirements, and what you do is you tighten your credit standards. Conversely, if you are a, an investment bank, and what the investment banks were doing, they were operating like big hedge funds, they were issuing short-term debt, let's say three to six month commercial paper, maybe one year debt. Every time it came due, they would roll it over, and investors would buy it because they thought that the investment bank had a positive net worth. But when the net worth positions of the investment banks fell because of these losses, like commercial mortgage-backed securities, as well as subprime, then the investors in these uninsured debt securities that were funding them, so they were issuing debt, short-term debt, rolling it over, and they were buying long-term, highly risky debt, private equity positions, junk bonds, subprime, commercial mortgage-backed securities, and God knows what. Okay. Now, when they take the losses on their net worth and investors realize that they don't have much net worth, they are no longer able to roll over the debt. And they too will stop <laughs> buying mortgage-backed securities. And finance companies that would make auto loans could no longer issue debt to make auto loans. They also tighten credit standards. And they, what happened to the securities markets? Well, hey. Um, Nobody knew what knew the positions of other people. So Ben Bernanke was very, is very fond of pointing out that the magnitude of the losses on subprime was not as big as the uncertainty that it created. And the uncertainty was partly created because credit default swaps were not issued through clearinghouses. Anybody could issue a credit default swap in the old days. And they didn't, they didn't really report these positions. And nobody knew who was issuing a credit default swap. They didn't know what the indirect exposures were. And so when the crisis hit and people started to realize, look, 
risking all these open securities, stocks, bonds, everything else, soars, risk premium rise, stock market loses half of its value between late 2007 and early 2009, bond yield spreads rise, now normally the BAA rate is two percentage points above the 10 year treasury, it rose to five and a half percent shortly after Lehman died. We hadn't seen those spreads since the Great Depression. And what that does is, that's the, the, the required rate of return goes up on bonds. The required rate of return on stocks also goes up. Dividends are kind of fixed in a short run. The only way for the dividend price ratio to go way up is if the price goes way down. Securities markets get hit, stock wealth goes down, the ability to issue bonds gets down. This is the perfect storm. <coughs> This is the nightmare scenario. What happened was if we lost, if the losses were great enough that we started losing one of the big institutions, the party's over, and basically you're in the fight of your life. And unfortunately this occurred. Now, this is very simplistic because, well, of course there are feedback. So let me give you a feedback. These are really complicated. Let's think about, uh, uh, so suppose the ability to issue debt in the securities markets dries up. Well, banks and other financial intermediaries often rely on some of that funding to make loans. They can't make those loans. They tighten their credit standards. That in turn makes housing demand even worse. And you can see all these feedback loops. This is the correlated risk problem. So after the crisis, what, what, what's the consensus? Real estate busts are very deadly. Credit booms typically spawn real estate bubbles that pose correlated risks. Micro pru is necessary, but it's not sufficient. You can't just magically assume there'll be a macro policy cleanup. There's a lot of complexity. What are the interrelationships? Monetary policy? Monetary policy is a blunt instrument. It's intended basically to affect the the pace of growth, and the rate of inflation. And if you give it more than that, it's hard to, hard to hit multiple targets. So that led, led people to believe now that there's a role for an extra policy tool, macroprudential policy. The idea is you focus on systemic risk, the risk at the macro level. And basically, you want to do this for two reasons. First, the financial system may not be resilient enough for policies to clean up. And you want to, you, can't, you cannot go back to the old days. Uh, Adair Turner, who's associated with Oxford, uh, wrote a very nice book. And basically, he argues that their individual lenders don't take into account the externality that they impose. If I make extra loans to you, it may create excess demand in, in, in markets and create a little bit of a, a supply problem. But if we all, all of our lenders do that, we could, have a, we could have a lending boom. And as a result, we really need to prevent these imbalances of building before the crises occur. We also need to address the fact that these, these, these excesses over lending amplifies these shocks. And then you've got the problem of the macro damage. So let me talk a little bit about, well, there are the problems. What can we do about them? Quite a bit. In the United States, uh, our regulatory reforms took the form of Dodd, the Dodd-Frank Act, which was passed in 2010. But a lot of the rules were not, reg were not stipulated by Congress. Congress basically said to regulatory agencies, here are some goals, figure out the, the, the new rules you need to write. And it took us a long time to write them. In Europe, it took the form of what's called the Capital Directives 4 and Capital Market Requirement Regulation and what they call the Harmonized Implementation of Basel III. Now, that sounds like a lot of bureaucratic baloney, but it isn't. There's actually some really good meat in here. And if we cut it down to the essence, what, what do they do? First, you want to raise capital requirements on banks. You want to have more skin in the game. You want to have more buffers so they can survive ahead. Second, you want stress tests 
and I'll get into why we want stress tests. Uh, you want to limit risk taking in securities markets, the Volcker rule, for example. You want to limit what borrowers can do. So in the United States, we put limits on debt service to income ratios. How many, what are your mortgage payments to income ratios going to look like? And we also change the liquidity requirements on banks and money, money market funds. Uh, so let's take each of these in turn and I can flush this out. For capital requirements, uh, we basically raised the, uh, we raised the capital requirements. We not only said you have to have capital against extra risks, but we also just said sometimes it's a little di difficult to figure out how risky things are. There may be overall leverage ratios as well. And we wanted to add something called a capital, uh, countercyclical capital buffer. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm losing some of that. Okay, so what's the idea of a countercyclical ca capital buffer? There was a chart here. Uh, in good times, <laughs> uh, the chart uh, actually, uh, when, I, when I first worked at, in Washington in the late 1980s, we never had uh, computer screens. We, we, we basically had to use paper charts. But, but picture a, um, picture there are good times. And in good times, banks like to make lots of loans. Well, maybe in good times you say to the bank, well, here's your base Here's your baseline capital requirement. We're going to require you in good times to build up more of a capital buffer. What that will do is it'll limit your lending in a boom, which will tend to restrain the boom part of the phase. And it takes two forms. One is you could restrict your asset growth, or you may retain more of your profits and not pay them out of dividends, and you build up your, you build up your capital. And the idea is that in good times, the, the effective capital requirement's a little higher, so it limits the boom. But when bad times occur, you say to banks, okay, there are bad times. This is time to use that buffer. You can, run, you can, you can absorb some losses, but you don't have to cut your lending because we don't want pro-cyclical lending. And this is a pro-cyclicality with capital requirements. In good times, you don't have many losses, you got lots of capital, you make even more loans, you're very pro-cyclical on the upside. <laughs> De bad times, you take the losses, you lose capital, you pull back on lending, that makes the economy even worse. So you draw that down. Okay. Uh, other, bank, other countries have done things where they um, and say, well, we're going to put minimum risk weights on different things. We're going to supplement the, the core capital requirements. Uh, in the United States, we said if you are a particularly big company, a systemically important financial institution, SIFI, it rhymes with SICKY, uh, just kidding, uh, but uh, what's the idea? If, if a bank has a big externality, they have to have extra capital. It reflects the fact that if a small bank fails, the system can absorb it. If a big bank fails, on the other hand, there could be big ramifications. So the bigger banks have the bigger capital cushions. Some countries, like Switzerland and the United States, have put capital surcharges on what they consider to be particularly risky loans. In Switzerland, there are some extra capital requirements on certain types of real estate. In the United States, we require even more capital on what we call construction and land development loans. These are the loans used to basically provide to clear the land, to put in the utilities, to build the commercial real estate buildings. These things, these are long exposures. So those are the, cap those are the capital requirements. What's the problem? The problem is, in the old days, banks had a lot of discretion as to when they would declare a loss. Lehman, Lehman's investment grade status was reaffirmed a few weeks before it failed. On paper, it looked great. But the reality was they may not have fully reported their losses. Or there was maybe they were so exposed that those losses could manifest themselves very quickly. So capital may seem to be there, but it really isn't there. 
The idea of a stress test is you want to um, you want to prevent banks from doing bad things. So the stress test is you know, let's suppose uh, let, let's create a scenario: high unemployment, falling housing prices, high interest rates. Can your what is going to happen to the losses on your loans and your securities? And the, are those losses going to? Do you have enough capital to absorb those losses? And what it does is it provides a check that there isn't window dressing, but the capital requirements really are there. And so you want to prevent banks from picking riskier loans within the loan category if it's a weight. You want to prevent them from delaying the write-offs of bad loans. You want them not, you want to prevent them from taking big tail risks or engaging in new financial innovations that you may not have had explicit risk requirements on. So the regulators have the discretion to say, okay, there's a new product. <laughs> Until it's stress tested, but tested by the market's ups, ups and downs, well, you're going to have a little extra capital. And then finally, you want to avoid, so you want to prevent banks from what the Australians like to refer to as adopting a black letter approach, a literal approach to regulation. In America, the, uh, the, the culture is one of you want to meet the letter of the law, and then you, you, avoid, uh, you avoid taxes. You, don't, you can't evade, but you can avoid taxes. You, you want to avoid capital requirements. Well, you want to change that mentality to a culture of prudence. And what the stress test does is the regulator says, you know, maybe on paper it seems like everything is fine, but when we stress test it, it isn't. And guess what? You're going to be required to hold more capital. The other aspect, another aspect of regulation is to limit risk taking in securities markets. So in Europe, many loans are, were funded by covered bonds. So the idea is if I'm a bank and uh, I have $300 million worth of loans that I won't, can't fund with deposits, what I will do is I will issue a bond that is collateralized by those $300 million in loans to fund those loans. And the investor not only has that as collateral, but they also have a claim on the bank as well, in case something goes wrong. The problem with covered bonds before the um, crisis was that um, there were limits on what could be securitized. So for example, in Spain, there were limits on uh, you could not uh, securitize a real estate loan if the loan to value ratio was above 80%. Sounds like a good limit. The problem was the loan amount was known. The value was not the sales price, it was the appraised price. And there were concerns that the appraisers were overappraising the properties. They changed that. And the requirements are tightened, so you can't securitize high LTV stuff anymore. In the US, we don't rely on covered bonds, we securitize. What's the problem with securitization? Well, one problem is, if I securitize a risky asset, so I'm a bank, I make a loan, I get my fees, I securitize the loan, I say, hey, this is a great loan. I pay the ratings agencies, who magically give me a very nice rating. Um, hey, it's double A, we want your business. Uh, and what happens? Well, if you don't have any risk retention, you might, you might see some banks selling assets, selling loans that are perhaps more risky than they really are. What Dodd-Frank has done is there is, uh, for, for many types of lo securitized loans, there's what we call 5% uh, risk retention. So if I'm the issuer of a commercial mortgage-backed security, and virtually all of them are issued by big banks, you have to take the first 5% of losses on those bonds, even if you don't hold the bonds. And what that does is it creates, it makes the banker more responsible for what is securitized. And remember, a lot of what was securitized, subprime loans, alternative A mortgages, and, a lot of, and some questionable commercial, mortgage, commercial mortgages before the crisis. 
Um, the other thing is we also limit now what types of mortgages can be securitized. And what we do in the United States is we don't have a loan to value limit. We say that the debt service to income ratio on mortgages needs to be below 43% if they're going to be securitized. And there's some other restrictions. Moreover, if you're a banker, if you make a loan with a, with a debt service to income ratio above that, and you have unusually high fees and odd pricing, you are now going to be more vulnerable to being sued by the borrower and the regulatory agencies ex post. So uh, this is how we limited some of that risk taking. Yes, is still quite a high number. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, really representative household. It used to be, exactly, and, and David is right, it used to be in the United States, uh, the, the debt service limits were about 36%. Yeah. And that was the case when my, my spouse and I bought our first home. Now, uh, one of the things about the regulatory reform is you don't want to rely on any one tool. Right? Remember, there the, uh, depends on where you're from, but there are three base, the three C's of lending: right? collateral, capacity, character. What do I mean by that? Collateral is there is there enough skin in the game by the borrower? Capacity do they have can they meet the cash flow aspects of the loan? Character, do they have a credit history? They, do they seem to be, do they seem to not, not pose as much moral hazard? Why do they rely on all, all those three in the old days when banks held the loans? Because if somebody games one of those things and looks great, they might take risks on the other two. Same thing with regulator, regulatory reform. We don't want to rely on any one thing because the system can be gained. The other thing that they're also doing is limiting what borrowers can do. Some countries put caps on LTV ratios. Others set limits on debt service to income ratios. Hong Kong has had a history of changing loan to value ratios to limit its real estate cycles. In Europe, some countries have imposed LTV caps. Britain has something a little interesting. They, they say, well, well, let banks make some commercial decisions. Maybe in some cases, high loan to income ratio loans are legitimate, taking into account other aspects of what the borrower is doing. But you may have to limit the percent of your portfolio that you'll do that in. Liquidity. Why do they put liquidity requirements? And here's the idea. Suppose a bank is making a bunch of loans. Loans are very illiquid. They make loans and hold securities. They get their funds from depositors and from financial markets. The financial market stuff can dry up. You can run short on liquidity. And the central bank may be tough to, to may be tough at the central bank to give you that liquidity in a crisis. Uh, perhaps stigma. So, what we've done is we've required banks to increase their liquidity in two ways. We have something called the liquidity coverage ratio. And what a bank has to do is figure out what proportion of its deposits could run off in the next 30 days. So suppose it's five billion dollars. We require that the bank have in its portfolio of assets $5 billion of highly liquid securities that it could sell, let's say sh very short-term treasury bills or gilts, that they will not take a capital loss on. And so in other words, if their deposits run up, run off, they can liquefy their highly liquid assets and still keep their li illiquid assets and not have a fire sale. Uh, we have a net sta stable funding ratio that, that's at a one-year horizon. So what do these things do? They limit the risk that funding can dry up. So in the crisis, funding did dry up for some banks that were relying on uninsured debt. It lowers the risk of a fire sale. So if you have a lot of, you have a lot of real estate loans, you don't just dump them on the market. The prices of those loans plummet and that brings down the capital value of everybody else. 
and you raise the financial system's cost of funding very risky assets indirectly. Other tools, uh, real fast, um, we did a lot of things. I want to focus on just a couple. In the United States, if a banker ran short on liquidity, they could come to the discount window, and then we get an overnight loan. So for, so for example, suppose your bank relied on uninsured, uninsured debt. You lost, let's say, $3 billion in runoffs. In other words, you couldn't renew $3 billion. You come to the Fed. You pledge as collateral, let's say, $3 billion in, maybe more than $3 billion in loans. We give you an overnight loan, and you're liquid overnight. The problem is that these loans are longer lasting, and if you have a severe crisis, banks might need to borrow for a longer term. So we've created something called the term auction facility. That was one. Two, there's an issue of stigma. If the market finds out that you're borrowing from the, from the central bank, People hit the panic button. You, you incur more uninsured debt runoffs as the crisis gets worse. So part of what we did was we kind of asked everybody, all the banks, to borrow. So if they all borrow from us, nobody is stigmatized. It's called the convoy system. A uh, couple of other things that in Europe, it took the form of the long-term refinancing operations where the um, ECB basically offered long-term funding of banks to make loans. That stabilized things. Uh, we even, in the United States, led to primary dealers. So the idea is, it, it, suppose you have a commercial crisis, sorry, a real estate, real estate or financial crisis. What happens? The dealers in securities, they make markets. They have inventories of securities that they use to, to, to deal with the buy and sell orders. So, uh, you people may want to buy securities, you people may want to sell securities. The dealer, him, him or herself, has to be liquid. And they get that liquidity either from the market or from a bank. If that, that liquidity dries up, what happens is the market makers are gone. The people who arrange the sales of securities are gone. And if the stock markets don't work, we're in a lot of trouble. So the Fed offered to back up the dealers. Credit market easing. Here's the idea of... There may be times when the central bank may have to be a little more direct. So in the United States, uh, one of particular facilities I think is really worth mentioning is the commercial paper funding facility. Commercial paper is short-term debt. It's uninsured. So let's think about a situation. Suppose um, uh, I'm, company, I'm, I'm the uh, big American corporation. I borrow $5 billion in short-term commercial paper that rolls over every three months from five big money market mutual funds. Each of those mutual funds looks at me and says, oh, the, the very big American corporation's been around forever. It's going to survive. No problem. However, in a financial crisis, here's the risk. I have to roll this debt over. Each of you not only has to have confidence in me, but you also have confidence that each of you will be willing to roll over the debt. Because if one of you doesn't, then the company can't roll over the debt. In other words, five billion is due and we can only raise four billion. And the fear that somebody else may not lend or renew or roll its debt over, that alone can cause the commercial ma paper market to freeze up. And in fact, it did. So what happened? What did the Fed do? Now normally, Commercial paper sells at 30 basis points, 30, 40 basis points above the three-month treasury bill rate. It's to the very, very best companies. What the Fed did was say, okay, uh, suppose John is a money market mutual, manages a money market mutual fund. He says, I don't know, I, I think the Duca Corporation's fine, but I don't know about the rest of you, <laughs> right? So what the Fed does is the Fed says, okay, we are gonna be willing to buy commercial paper from the very best companies at 100 basis points above the three-month treasury bill rate. Now all of a sudden, John doesn't have to worry about the other, others showing up, because if they don't show up, Father Fed will show up. And in fact, the Fed basically bought just about all the commercial paper that was issued for a few weeks there. We, owed it, we ended up owning at 1.20% of the commercial paper market. 
We stopped the commercial paper market from disappearing. The Great Depression, we didn't. 90% of, of the real value of commercial paper outstanding disappeared in the Great Depression. 90%. It took decades to get the commercial paper market back. Um, we reverted that. Um, what about other but tools? A, a yeah. hundred is much bigger than 30. So there was a wedge driven right. there, which right, but but nothing was selling. This, this is this, the spreads were going. The spreads were going up two, three hundred basis points, and if you could even issue it, and we're talking about the very, very best companies in the world. If they go, party's over. Yes. Pure and simple. What about other tools? What can we also do? Well, one of the things we haven't. Well, in the United States, there are mortgage equity withdrawals. So when people uh, basically re refinance their, their mortgages, they borrowed more than the original balance or the outstanding balance they borrowed, and it made their consumption very susceptible to house price swings. Uh, before the crisis, if you did this, you paid nothing more. In other words, you got the same interest rate for borrowing, let's say, 10 or 20 percent more against the value of your house for the refinancing, as if you didn't. In other words, you're borrowing more, but you're not, your risk profile is going up, but you're not paying for it. That was the old days. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac raised those fees tremendously. There's hardly any, there's very, very little cash out refinancing right now. The state of Texas said, once you buy a house, you can't, you cannot increase the value of the mortgage, if you refinance it, if that refinancing um, results in a loan to value exceeding 80%. And that, that prevent, prevented people from overborrowing. The derivatives markets, we have a clearing, we have more of a clearinghouse situation. In other words, uh, you, you don't have a situation where uh, a very big company, there was one insurance company in particular, I won't mention the name, uh, they insured billions and billions and billions of, of bonds, and they did not retain much of a pool from the premiums that they charged to bear those losses. And the insurance that they gave was worthless. And when other institutions figured out it was worthless, the financial markets seized up. So there's been a big effort to uh, fix the derivatives markets, and uh, spillovers, complexity, uh, we have what's called heat and radar maps. Picture this, there are, there are a lot of many markets in the, in the world, many markets within a country. So we have the, what we call heat or radar maps. And basically it works like this, it's a visual tool. The visual tool is something like if things are okay, maybe it's green. If things are maybe built, some problems may be there, maybe it's yellow. And maybe that color market is red if there's a problem. And what it does is it helps the, helps the regulators and the, and the policy makers be able to quickly spot in the midst of all these different markets where the risks are. Uh, there's a particularly good paper by uh, collaboration with the Bank of England. There's a fellow named David Aikman who's co collaborated with several people at the Federal Reserve Board and had a very nice uh, heat map. Um, it's a good tool. So let me uh, wrap up. We went through a tremendous crisis um, in the West. And uh, it highlighted many regulatory shortcomings. It clearly implied that we needed macroprudential tools. Now, one thing I should mention, uh, the evidence suggests that macroprudential policy can limit, but it can't really eliminate every risk. Uh, right now, uh, commercial mortgage, commercial real estate valuations are quite high. Uh, and it's not because risk premiums are low, it's because we're in a world of low real interest rates. Um, and those low real interest rates are needed because the macroeconomy economies are not quite functioning as well as they, they used to. In the U.S., we had many reforms. It was like a kitchen sink approach, uh, partly because crises uh, highlight 
reduce political barriers to getting things done. Um, and, but what we're doing is we're adjusting the implementation. So for example, uh, there's a concern that maybe we, uh, the regulatory burden from Dodd-Frank was a bit much on small banks. Um, and so we're, we're adjusting, we're tailoring the regulations so that, that we, don't make, we don't make all these rules that basically make it hard to have a small bank. In Europe, there's a lot of effort made at harmonizing capital and bank regulation, creating a European-wide bank regulatory authority. What do we have in the U.S.? I, I won't speak so much for Europe. We certainly have a safer financial system. Problem is, we're also seeing very weak business formation. You know, do, do we overregulate small business loans, making them too infeasible to make? Uh, are we preventing companies from um, going public? That actually has less to do with Dodd-Frank and more to do with Serbian Zox. These are things that we're talking about. We have put big capital surcharges on systemically important companies. The, sh there's the share, uh, for example, at the end of 2012, the four largest banks in the United States, I believe, had about 54% of the entire system banking system's assets. I recalculated that. Uh, I think it's down to 46% now. So these capital surcharges are encouraging a more diversified banking system. Um, but the, one of the things you've got to keep in mind, though, is if you're raising the capital requirements on the banks, you're not doing it on securitization, you may get, it may not be as effective. In other words, if, if the risk is shifting to the commercial mortgage-backed securities market, the risk in the whole system may not be coming down as much as you'd like. And we, we did have, and I want to emphasize this, we had regulatory capital arbitrage that, that was really behind these twin bubbles. What do I mean by that? They cut the capital requirements in commercial mortgage-backed securities and sub, basically subprime mortgage-backed securities that encouraged a lot more borrowing in those markets. They did not cut the capital requirements for banks to hold those loans as whole loans. So you look at a bank balance sheet, you know, a bank has the loans and they have the capital there, everything's fine. Well, no, it's not fine because there are these other loans that are being made without much capital, with low down payments, with, high, with very high valuations, and you have risk, the risk is kind of shifted off the bank balance sheet. One of the interesting parallels, and I discovered this, in a, I've written a piece comparing the Great Recession and the Great Depression. There is an interesting parallel. There was, there was regulatory arbitrage in the 1920s. Go back in US history. Individuals were borrowing 90% 95% of the value of stocks, You're putting 5 or 10% down, borrowing the rest, speculating in the stock market. Where were they getting those loans? Well, they were getting them from different sources. In the, 19, in the late 1920s, the Federal Reserve told the member banks, not every commercial bank was a member of the Federal Reserve at the time, said, listen, there's a bubble building in the stock market. Don't make as many margin loans. Pull back. Because we wanted to prevent the banking system from funding a bubble on Wall Street that could result in problems. And guess what? The member banks did, you know, pull back. The problem was the life insurance companies, the investment trusts, the non-member banks, the banks that were not reporting to the Fed, and savings and loan institutions, mutual savings banks, they stepped in, they made the margin loans, the stock market continued to go crazy, that crashed, that had a lot of spillovers. Point is that if you have a regulatory system 
that only covers part of the part of the financial system, there's going to be a natural shifting of finance to the unregulated system, and you're not going to protect yourselves. Barry Eichengreen pointed this out in his book. It's a great book called Hall of Mirrors. But the point I'm trying to make here is regulatory arbitrage matters, and it matters a lot. Um, and we do not want to go. We're going to, there's probably going to be there's going to be some adjustment of capital requirements. Sorry, sorry. Adjustment of regulations. We want to keep the capital requirements strong. Uh, we want to prevent regulatory arbitrage. I think that's really important. Um, but you know the political system may be such that there may be some changes in regulation that, that you know we. It may be ill-advised. And before I get into any further trouble, I better stop right there. Thank you.